Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like you to welcome you to Cloud Week Kubernetes edition. We're kicking off today's session with a lecture from our friends at OVH uh, about operating cloud native services at scale. Uh, today, I have uh, with me Horacio Gonzalez, uh, who will be the speaker today. Horacio is a DevRel, I hope I pronounced that right, <laughs> at uh, OVH, who is tasked with building and fostering relationships with developers and helping them to build solutions using OVH products. Uh, so before we start, if you should have any questions regarding the presentation, uh, please use the chat. We will have a dedicated QA session at the end of the presentation when we will address all the, all the questions you might have. And now, without further ado, uh, Horacio, please take the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I am really happy to be there and to begin the conference with this session. I am going to talk about Kubernetes operators and about why and how do we use them at OBS Cloud. So before beginning, let me introduce myself and OBS Cloud. My name is Horacio Gonzalez. I am DevRel, Developer Relations at OBS Cloud. And OBS Cloud, yeah, but we are the biggest European hosting and cloud provider. We are, we have data centers all around the world, 30 data centers. We have a lot of customers. We have um, all kinds of products from the web to the cloud, public cloud, private cloud, bare metal servers. And especially for a conference in Poland, our company has a very tight relation with Poland because the, the founders, the founder family is, uh, comes from Poland. The Clava family is Polish. We have a data center in Poland and we have also offices there. And as many others, as our friends and Google Cloud, AWS, Microsoft, we, we offer a managed Kubernetes, our OBS Cloud managed Kubernetes. Our managed Kubernetes is built over OpenStack. Be why? Because all our public cloud is built on OpenStack. So it was the natural way for us to build our managed Kubernetes over our own public cloud. So most managed Kubernetes are similar. So it's a Kubernetes, it is managed for you. All the operations is done in our side. We have some interesting uh, kind of instance. We have a good price performance ratio and we have predictable pricing, but I am not here to sell you our managed Kubernetes. I am here because by building our managed Kubernetes, we have found some interesting problems about operating Kubernetes. And that's the part that gets interesting for this talk. Operating Kubernetes, it is, um, it is easier said than done. There are some hidden problems with you try to operate Kubernetes, especially when you try to operate Kubernetes at a scale. Kubernetes is really, really interesting, especially in a world with distributed systems, microservices. And today, when you want to deploy almost anything, you have a lot of instance all around. And then for that, Kubernetes is really good. You are going to be able to manage all those instances in an easy and clear way. And you are especially able to manage all those instances in a declarative way. So you are going to be high level. You are going to tell the system what is the desired state? Hey, I want to deploy this application, so I need one database with this kind of uh, storage and this kind of redundancy. I need three backend instance, two frontend instance, and you declare what you need, and Kubernetes is going to transform your declaration, your YAML files, into a lot of different objects. 
bots, deployments, services, ingress, load balancers, sidecars, replica set. And it's going to do all that for you from the declaration you have done. So it's great. You can deploy easily complicated architectures. Everything is good, no? Well, when you are learning, when you are deploying some test application, usually everything is good. But when you begin to do it in the real life, then it isn't always the case. When you have complex deployments and you must prepare the declaration of all those different objects by hand, you must write your configuration, your declaration files, your YAML files. For almost any real application, you are going to declare lots and lots and lots of things. And it can be quickly messy, especially when you are deploying in the same cluster, different applications in different namespace. One way to make things sample, more, more sample, it's to use some kind of package manager like Helm. Helm allows you to group all the elements for an application inside a Helm shard, a special configuration file that allows you to quickly deploy one complete application. So you don't worry any anymore in deploying, declaring one by one all the Yammer files. You do a global declaration. Hey, Elm, install a Kafka cluster. And Elm is going to install all the components for your Kafka cluster. And another advantage, you are going to be able to upgrade or roll back all the application at the same time. Let's say tomorrow there is a new Kafka version with a new Helm chart. You are going to say, hey, Helm, upgrade my Kafka. And it is going to deploy and to modify all the declaration in order to go to the new version or to roll back to the old one. So the complexity is well managed for the install and for the upgrade. But it is a still configuration. It is a still install a upgrade. And operating a, an application is way more than to install an upgrade. Human operators also deal with the life cycle of the application. They also need, they also need to be able to analyze the application and get some insight. Hey, looking at the logs, looking at the metrics, there is something that it isn't good. We have a bottleneck there. We need to act on that. And even he needs to be able to do things that make auto scaling a script, a scripting, all kind of operation in order to make the life of the application smoother. So Helm, it can help, it can, it can help, it can make things easier, but it isn't a real solution for the operation. And Kubernetes, Kubernetes is about automation. So the logical question is, could we try to automate the operation, the whole scope of a human operation, could you try to automate the business knowledge in order to reduce the number of tasks that human operators need to do during the application life? It should be done. And that's the idea behind the operators. But before going that, I am going to talk about one of the key of the cornerstone of the operators. It is the controllers. If you have done Kubernetes, you already know controllers because they are controllers installed by default. They are a, a control loop. They verify that the, your declaration, your desired state is implemented in the cluster. 
they look at your desired state, they look at the cluster state. Oh, you said you wanted three instances in the front end and there are only two instances running in the cluster right now. I am going to start another instance. Hey, you said you wanted your front end to talk to your back end and here it isn't talking. I am going to configure the link between the front and the back. So that's the controller. It makes a loop every time and try to reconcile, try to make that the desired state is the current state. And for doing that, it is going to do a loop. It is going to observe desired state, current state. It is going to find the difference between them and it is going to use the Kubernetes API in order to modify the current state to make it more similar to the desired one, in order to start an instance, in order to create some object, in order to stop an instance if there are too many of them. That's the role of a controller. And as I told before, there are controllers for most of the standard objects in Kubernetes. But, but in Kubernetes, you can also create your own objects. It's the custom resources. So you can declare a custom resource definition in order to extend Kubernetes. For me, if Kubernetes is a big success today, it's in part grass to the CRD, to the custom resource definition, because it allows you to extend Kubernetes and to tailor it to your own needs. So you are going to define new kind of resources, higher level resources, low level resources. A resource can be a whole database, or can be a new kind of storage, and you are going to define those resources and use them after you have declared it as any other Kubernetes object using your YAML file. So we have controllers and we have new kind of resource, the custom resources. The idea is you can use a controller, a custom controller that you write to monitor your custom resources. So you can be sure that when you declare and use your custom resources, they are verified, they are watched by the custom controller to be sure that your decided state is the state of your cluster. So we had a Controllers, custom resources. Let's talk about the center of this talk, the operators. Remember, the idea was to try to automize the human knowledge, the human knowledge of the operator of the application. We try to encode, to define the knowledge in a, in a clear form and put it into software to allow Kubernetes to do most of the usual operation tasks in an automated way. It will never replace a real human operator, but if it is well done, it can make the human operator life way easier because most of the day-to-day -day, um, tasks can be done by the operator. And the human operator is there when there is a big problem with new th things need to be done and to be there when the knowledge of the Kubernetes operator is enough to deal with the situation. Um, a good example would be databases. Yeah, administering databases is a difficult problem. For example, let's say you have a distributed database and you want to add a new instance. 
Well, it depends of what kind of database. Some of them will need uh, to stop the writing, doing some flushing into disk, add the new instance, verify quorum, and then begin to rebalance uh, the data. Other could be easier. Same about a backup. Some databases you can do a hot backup, other you need to stop reads or writes or both of them before doing the backup. Same thing about sharding. And so for databases, especially for distributed databases, human knowledge is very important. But if the human knowledge, a part of the human knowledge can be codified, we could think about a Kubernetes operator that do this kind of day-to-day -day task adding a new instance, doing a backup in a fully automated way without the human operator needing to, to type things in, his, in their console. So how can we encode this knowledge of the human operator? The idea is we are going to encapsulate this um, business logic, this human knowledge, in custom resource definition and controllers, CRD and controllers. So, for example, in our database, we can define a CRD for a database instance and another maybe for the database clusters, and we are going to encode, we are going to program a database instance controller that makes sure that, hey, uh, the, we need to do a backup. So the controller knows that in order to do the backup, they must, it must stop the writes and the reads and they, it must do that, that, that. So when the instruct, when the decided state is daily backup, the controller can do that. There is another controller for the cluster object. Yeah, so we need to add a new instance. The procedure to add a new instance, the controller notes it and can execute the work procedure to add a new instance without having a human operator doing that by hand. So that's the interest of uh, operators. They allow you to codify the human knowledge and automatize, automize the different task, tasks. And in order to do that, an operator is always or almost always comprised of one of several CRD, custom resource definition, and one of several controllers operating together. So the CRD are deployed and managed on the cluster under the control of the controller that is going to do all the reconciliation loop with the, with the knowledge, with the human knowledge codified. What to do when there is this situation? Let me see, they told me to do that, 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 that. And how about if we lose one instance? Well, if we lose one instance, we must we must begin. A, we must start a new instance. At doing that, 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 that. So the controller has all the procedures and manages the custom resources. Operators can be really simple or really complex, and all operators <laughs> aren't similar. So in order to better understand the capabilities of a given operator, operators have, have been divided in five phases, five kind of operators, five levels of capability. The level one is basic install. It's an operator that is more or less like a very simple Helm chart. It allows you to easily install a complete application with all its components. A level one operator won't help you to do any upgrade, to do any day-to-day -day operation. They will be limited 
to make the install easy. And for some architectures, it's already very important. A level two operator, it can do the same thing, the basic install, but it can also easily do updates and rollbacks. There is some sense of versioning, so when a new version is available, you can, the operator can install the new version, doing a graceful upgrade, and if mm, something doesn't work, doing a graceful rollback, uh, to be sure that you have always the last version or the last stable version installed and running on your cluster. And these two steps, you could do it mostly with Helm shards. They are operators that aren't very smart. With level three, we begin to have some smart operat operators. They manage the life cycle of the application. For example, hey, we lose an instance. What can we do? Yeah, you need to do that, that, and then start a new instance and declare the new instance at the cluster manager for the quorum. Okay, great. Or we need to do a daily backup. Okay, the operator will be able to do all the tasks and generate the daily backup. So with level three operators, many day-to-day -day tasks of the human operator are transferred to the Kubernetes operator. It isn't really smart, but it is really, really useful. With level four, we begin to have some more interesting intelligence because in level four, uh, the operator is able to take the metrics, the logs, the traces, and to analyze the behavior of the application. It's going to take, for example, uh, the metrics of response times and saying, hey, it seems to have a bottle, a bottleneck there. And uh, either it will span, it, it will mm, tell the operator or send a report. It is going to be able to do also things like, hey, it seems we are, mm, we are getting a growing load. So maybe uh, we need to prepare that uh, and add a new instance uh, tomorrow or more disco. It's already a very interesting, a very intelligent operator, but the level five, is the, for the moment the, the highest of an operator is the autopilot. Then a level five operator, when with the insights say, hey, we are going to need a new instance, it is able to span along the new instance, adding it to the application and make it in work. Oh, it seems the load is too weak now. So we can take off and stop some instance. It's able to not only analyze the situation of the application, but act on that situation and doing things, doing the kind of things that a human operator could do. As I told you, they are still sample, some piece of code. They aren't going to replace the real knowledge and experience of a real human operator, but they are going to be able to do many, most of the day-to-day -day operations of the application and your human operator will be able to use their knowledge and their expertise for more interesting matters that day-to-day -day operation. So these five levels are the operator capability model and when you see operators in uh, open source operators or you go into uh, operatorhub.io, you will see that most operators declare what are they level. So you know what kind of help the operator will be able to give you. So let's say you have an application and you want to write an operator for your application. It is easy, it is difficult. Well, it isn't very difficult. 
It can be rather systematic. You create your new project for your operator and you begin by defining the custom resources you are going to need for your application. Hey, I am going to need a database instance resource and a database cluster resource and maybe this and that, some backup resource in order to deal with all the backup process. You define the CRD that are going to be declared and used in the Kubernetes API. And then you define what are the attributes of these uh, resources that you are going to watch. A, for the database instance, I am going to watch the, the volume capa capacity to be, to be sure that the disk is in full, the response time, and this, that, that. And for the cluster, the number of instance, the level of sharding, that, that, that. And when you have specified your resources and what do you want to watch, then you write the controllers. Then you, and you need to do it working together with the human operators. The best way, if it, if it is the human operator, the DevOps, the sysadmin who writes that part, because they will need to translate their knowledge into code. So in order to do a backup, so in order to do the ba a backup, I must do that, that, that. Okay, I'm going to code first step that, second step that, and the sysadmin, the DevOps, the operator, translate their knowledge into controllers. And when you have the CRD, the attribute to watch and the controllers, you can build the operator and then you deploy it in your Kubernetes cluster like any other Kubernetes object. You can do it all by hand because they are CRD and controllers. You can do it in Go, without lots of problems. But there are some frameworks to make the operator developer life easier. The first one for me is a Cube Builder. Cube Builder is an SDK in order to create CRD and their associated controllers. You are going to create your CRD and, the con and write the controllers in Go and they, Cube Builder is going to do most of the boilerplate, most, most of the repetitive and connective code. And you can spend your time coding your knowledge into code. Cube Builder is really good for small projects. For big projects, there is a, an open source project, the Operator Framework. The operator framework has lots of sub projects. And the idea is to make easier and faster the operator development. There is an SDK, there is a lifecycle manager, there are tools in order to do, to test and improve the performance of your operator. The SDK will allow you to build, to test in your computer or in the cluster and to iterate to improve your operator. And using the operator SDK, you can write your operator either using Helm, like if your operator is going to be mainly Helm charts, using Ansible. So if you are already a DevOps or sysadmin using Ansible, you can write your complete operators in Ansible or using Go because Go, Golang, is the by default language in Kubernetes. The only thing to know is that if you are using Helm, you are going to be limited to the kind of things that Helm can do. It means level one and two. But if you are using Ansible and Go, you will be able to write operators as complex as you will want. Another interesting component of the operator framework is the lifecycle manager that can be used to, when you are going to install several operators in the same clusters, 
the Lifecycle Manager will help you to install these operators to be sure that they are in incompatible. For example, imagine that two different operators declare the same kind of custom resource. Uh, it can provoke some problems. With the Lifecycle Manager, it's going to verify that, that you have your operators in style. They can be together. They aren't, uh, or they are in different namespace. You can update your operators following the life cycle. So it's a very interesting administration tool when you are working with operators on your cluster. And there is operatorhub.io. I talked uh, about that uh, some minutes ago. The idea is an open source repository of some of the most popular open source operators. So let's say you are going to, um, you need to install an ACA cluster, for example, because it is the first one. Hey, you have a Helm chart, but you want some intelligence in your operator. You go to operator IO. Oh, there is a ACA cluster operator. Uh, you can inspect it. You can see its capabilities and you can directly via the lifecycle manager uh, install the ACA operator coming from operatorhub.io. It's a big repository of uh, Kubernetes operators. And I am here because we at OVH Cloud, we like operators. As I told before, we are operating lots of Kubernetes, our own Kubernetes and all the Kubernetes of our customers. A managed Kubernetes means that our customers can use their Kubernetes, but we operate them. So we need to be able to operate a lot of different, uh, lot of Kubernetes, very different, some with a lot of load, other with a small load, uh, some that have a lot of nodes, other with only a handful of nodes. And we need to be able to operate all of them, internal and external. So we began to get interested in operators rather quickly. I am going to talk about two examples of operators that we have developed and we use at Tobias Cloud. The first one is the Harbor operator. Harbor is a Docker registry. It means you use Harbor when you want to put your Docker image somewhere but they aren't public image. If there were public image, you could simply put them in the Docker Hub, no problem. But if you want to keep your private image for your internal application stored in some place and you want to control access, who can do that? You need a private registry. Harbor is an open source private registry. Why we have written at Harbor Operator? Well, the idea is when we began, when we released our managed Kubernetes, people began to use it and many customers asked us, hey, we also need a registry. Why? Because with your Kubernetes, we are using more and more image and some of them are public open source project, but we also have some applications that are private. We won't, we don't want them we don't want to put them in a public registry, and we don't want to install and manage our own registry. If we use a managed Kubernetes, it's because we don't want to manage, so we don't want to install a cluster, a private registry. Okay, so we needed to build a private registry. As a Tobias Cloud, we the open source it is in our DNA. We are really pro open source. We we look it around. Hey, so there is an open source Docker registry. It's rather minimalist, but there are some open source projects that leverage on the Docker registry and add all kind of things in order to make them enterprise ready. Let's say. You have access control, you have some versioning control, you have a different project with different access. 
So we look at around the two biggest projects at the time well, were Harbor and Portus. And it seems that the community was most in the side of Harbor. It was more popular, it, wa it has more contributors, it was a cloud native, native uh, foundation CNCF project, so it means that it was recognized by the community and it was easy to test uh, using some Helm charts. So it was a good idea. Portus is a very good project, but with less traction. So if we wanted to build our managed private registry, we told ourselves, hey, let's go in to build it with the biggest project with Harbor. A Harbor is a complicated project. When you deploy a Harbor registry, we, you are deploying lots of components. You have a Redis key value database, you have a PostgreSQL, you are using mostly Elm to deploy it. You have some uh, engines uh, server in order to do all the reverse proxy and routing. You have the hardware components. You have notary in order to do vulnerability scan and conformity of image. You have chart museum that allows you to store in hardware, not only Docker image, but, all, but also Helm shards. There are lots of elements. So we told ourselves, okay, but there is at least a Helm shard. You should, it should do it. It should be easy. Well, it is really easy to test. It is really easy when you are installing one registry for yourself. But what about if you are installing a lot of registries, one for each customer? What about if you are if you have some complex request for the routine? What about if you want to be sure that every user has a different database, but you want to mutualize the engine? What when you have several hundreds of individual registry and you have pods all, ar all around your clusters? How do you manage that? And the idea is the Helm chart doesn't scale. It's really good for one install, but when you are operating at the scale, it falls short. So we wanted to do a managed private registry. Our requirements were simple, I could say. We wanted to have one individual hardware instance per customer. We wanted to be able to deploy an instance in one click or even better with an API. So the idea is the, the customer is in our UI, in our obvious cloud manager, and he clicks and I want a new private registry and all the install should be automat automated. That means that a sample Helm chart isn't enough and Helm chart must be done by hand, Helm install. We wanted something that could be done by, by a API call. We wanted that the data be really isolated from one customer to the other because Docker image and Helm chart are very uh, sensible uh, stuff. And we wanted to have shared, shared tools. We wanted to have all the components not directly related to data to be shared between different customers in order to be able to propose a uh, private uh, registry cost as, as smaller as possible. And another, we didn't want to reinvent every time things that we already have. So we wanted to be able to use our Redis or PostgreSQL as a service, our object storage as a service, our ingest controller, reuse our services. Even more, 
we wanted to leverage on the platform we be building our private registry on Kubernetes. We wanted to use Kubernetes native uh, RBAC uh, for the um, access control, security policies. We wanted to use the API validation. We wanted to it to be a modular and we wanted to have the extensibility, for example, in order to create and to add new functionalities, some in the open source project, some in other projects to us. So we wanted to fully leverage in Kubernetes. The idea was, okay, we need to automate all that. We need to an operator for hardware. We looked around in the open source community, there wasn't any operator. Uh, but when we talk with community leaders and with community people, everybody said, hey, it will be a great idea. If you write it, it will be really nice. So we needed the operator and the community needed the operator. We decided to write it and because uh, we believe in giving back to the open source. We decided to write it to separate our internal needs from the general operator and to release in open source the general, the operator. The problem to write a hardware operator is the reconciliation loop, the controller. Why? Because the controller, you must code in the controller the knowledge to operate hardware. And this knowledge is complex. Harbor has many elements. There are many possible states. They have, uh, Harbor ha has external dependencies. So you need to try to get the state of external dependencies within uh, your Kubernetes clusters. And there are some errors, for example, there is an external component that is missing that are difficult to fix. So trying to translate the human knowledge into an operator, into CRD and controllers was relatively difficult. Uh, our team worked uh, for, uh, with, uh, for a long time. They used Cube Builder and they wrote, they wrote everything in Go and they created a first version of the operator with only one custom resource, the hardware um, instance, and one controller. And they add a lot of different components, internal components for the clusters. They use other existing operators in order to delegate uh, tasks because we were, we were building a hardware operator, but our hardware operator needed to manage certificates. So, hey, there is already a really good operator to manage certificates, cert manager. So our operator use cert manager in order to manage certificates and we concentrate ourselves in hardware knowledge. We also added open tracing in order to be able to measure the state of the operator and its performance everywhere at any moment in order to improve it over the time. So we built it several months ago, three months ago, we released it in open source. We donated it to the CNCF and now it is part of the Harbor project. There is a, in the Harbor organization in GitHub, you have the Harbor operator. It is an example of why we needed to build an operator and what we did, how do we build it and what we did with it after building it. Another example, rather different, is our load balancer operator. I think I need to go a bit faster. So a load balancer for a cloud provider is really critical. You are going to have the load balancer as entry point, and it's going to dispatch the request to the internal servers. We already have a very robust load balancer stack with excellent performance because we have built it 
Uh, for our needs, directly using our own servers and BGP uh, with servers that are custom built for network traffic, we put on the load balancer the TLS termination, so the certificates, but our stack, it isn't cloud ready. I mean that uh, we are using a load balancer stack that is pilot by configuration files. So when you want to add a new load balancer, you are going to add it to the com configuration and reload the configuration. When you have thousands and thousands of load balancer, this configuration reloading can be a slow or at least slower enough to be a problem in a cloud native world. Having to wait two minutes in order to have your load balancer can be too much. And we also have another problem. As I told yourself, we were using custom made hardware, custom made servers. So we at OBS Cloud, we build, we build all our servers, but the load balancer one needs special components. They are slower, slower to build and they, they need to be dispatched to all our data centers around the world. So it is a bit of a bottleneck. We wanted to have a new load balancer, a cloud ready supporting mass update without having to reload all the configuration uh, to be able to be configurable uh, on the fly uh, really quickly to instantiate the new load balancer easy to operate and especially fully integrated with our public cloud. And so we decided to build it on Kubernetes. We wanted to have uh, some Kubernetes clusters dedicated to the load balancing with load balancer pods. And in these pods, we wanted to have an, uh, in each pod one instance of HAE proxy and several network interfaces. One network interface uh, from the input request and another from our, int our internal network to dispatch the request and the control interface. And when, as we were putting all that in pods, we could also add some sidecars, some small containers in order to take the logs and the metrics and send that to our observability platform. So on the paper, the idea was great. We have our pod, we can create all the load balancer pods we need. We can configure them on the fly because as we have one pod per customer, per load balancer customer, we can configure it. the configuration uh, reload time is almost uh, instant. So it was a, a good approach. But, but we need to be able to orchestrate um, thousands, tens of thousands, potentially um, one million of this load balancer. So doing that by hand, cube control apply uh, dash F, it wasn't an option. We need to automate that. In, and it's always the same story. Most uh, options work well for one install, but when you are at a scale, you need to automate. So we needed an operator, an HA proxy operator with our pod model. One of the problems was using the three different network interface in the pod. It is complicated. By default on Kubernetes, you need to use in the same pod all, always the same uh, network plugin. You need to have the same kind of interface in a same pod. We wanted to have different kind of interfaces, one using internal for uh, the configuration of the pod, and uh, the, the others use in a stem from, from and to the outside of the pod for the traffic. So we, we saw the Multus solution. Multus CNI, it's a plugin by Intel in order to allow you to have different network interface in the same pod. For example, we wanted to have 
some bridget interfaces and one host local interface. Using Moltus, it added a bit of complexity, so it gave us also another reason to automize, but it, allo it allows us to finally tune our network in our load balancer pod. So using Multus, we be able we are able to add and to remove network interfaces on the fly to modify them as we want using simply some YAML configuration. We have we had another problem. We needed to be able to push the configuration into the Ashe proxy into each one of the pods. For that, we said, oh, we can use config management, a config map in Kubernetes. It seems the right way to do it. Well, it is the right way if your config is static. You push the config map and Kubernetes take it and you sit in your pod. But if you are uh, changing the configuration, like adding a new route, it is a problem because there is no native watching and triggering from the config map. They are the config map in the pods. They are seen like files. And by default, uh, the pod doesn't do anything when the file changes. There is a, in the address there on the slide, you will have a lot of background information on how config map works and the problem of watching and triggering with config map. So we needed to add some components in order to do that. We needed to have a controller. The controller is a reconciliation loop, it's a watcher, watch the config uh, map, and when it has changed, it tells to the HA proxy, hey, you need to reload the configuration. Using the controller, we can do rather easily the watching and triggering and updating in real time the configuration of each one of our load balancers. We needed also observability. We tried to use the Prometheus operator. And once again, it's really nice. It works very well, but it didn't work so well with all the different uh, containers running in our pod. By default, the Prometheus operator is made to have one container in a pod. We have several containers, a shape proxy, the controller, the config. So we needed either to modify heavily it or use another thing. So as we have a metric stack based on warp 10, uh, we decided to send all the metric logs using a, a standard components we already have, an open source component called Vimeon to our observability stack, to our warp 10 in the observability stack. And now we are thinking about doing a fully Vimeon operator in order to standardize this part on all our, on all our infrastructure. So with this, with Multus, the controller for the config management, the observability, and the HA proxy pod, we build our we build our operator. It works. This one, for example, we haven't open sourced it. Why? Because it's something really made, custom made for our needs, our very special needs for and it wasn't mainly for an internal need. And the Harbor one, we have open sourced it. This one not. The Vimeo one, when we will do it, will be surely open source. The idea is you can do operators for your internal needs. Sometimes they make sense like this one. Uh, I am going to stop here because I want to have some time for, for questions. There is a new operator we are working on. It will be released in several weeks in order to manage not pools in Kubernetes. So to be able to automatically manage mm, different uh, not pools and making adding nodes to the node pool, removing nodes and all that. But I, I will write about that in our 
blog in a few weeks. Thank you very, very much. I hope you have liked the talk. Yeah, thank you very much, Horacio. Uh, was definitely quite the load of information you gave us here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as far as questions are concerned, we've got two questions uh, right now in the question section. One was about recording the webinar, and I just want to reconfirm, yes, we are recording the webinar, and we will make it available to all the participants that registered to this webinar. The other one, I'm afraid we answering it might easily take an hour or so, but maybe we can try at least to, yeah. to get uh, a few a few uh, bullet points across. The other question is by Krzysztof, and it's uh, what's the difference between Harbor and GitLab registry? Oh, well, both of them are uh, regi registries. You can do private registries with both of them for an user point of view they are rather similar gitlab uh, registry is fully integrated with the gitlab product suite and that's a very good point if you are installing the whole gitlab uh, suite with the registry with the ci cd with the repository because they work very well together uh, we wanted only the the registry at the time uh, the team look at different options and as we were doing the gitlab the full gitlab suite we decided to try to do an standalone project that like harbor but from most point of point of view from a user an end user point of view they are quite similar i would if i needed to advise which one to try if you want to have one complete solution for most of your development needs do gitlab you will have the repository, the CI/CD, the registry, and you can install all of that in Kubernetes, for example, in a really easy way. GitLab has fully understood that making and install an operation easy on Kubernetes is a good point. But if you only need a registry, personally, I would say, hey, you don't need all GitLab. Take a standalone project like Harbor, you are going to reduce complexity in a way. That uh, answer more or less the question. Well, uh, I'm not the one who was asking. However, I guess that uh, uh, yeah, that's that's quite quite uh, at least the one difference, and we can see that there is something something there in in Harbor as a specialized solution rather than having a. Uh, entire suite of, of solutions for, for different things. Yes, definitely. OK, uh, so I guess this concludes all our, all our questions we had. Uh, thank you very much, Horacio, again, for being with us. Thank you to oh, you. I, OK, I, I wait, wait, wait a second. We, we've got two more minutes, and I've got one more question. <laughs> Maybe we can do it. Uh, OK, on the beginning, you talk about OpenShift. So it is the real difference between clean Kubernetes and OpenShift uh, in possibilities of, well, OpenShift is a, a specialized enhanced Kubernetes. It's a Kubernetes with a lot of interesting um, components added by uh, Red Hat. So it's a, you could see it as a specialized uh, enterprise uh, Kubernetes distribution. Mm, there are many C CRD that are defined. So you take a basic Kubernetes, you add a lot of components, the CRD, other components, and you have an, an OpenShift. The big advantage is that your OpenShift, when you install, you have already all those components defined. The problem is that when you install it, you have already all those components defined. Advantage, problem, it depends on your needs. Personally, I, I, I prefer to begin with the open source Kubernetes distribution and then adding only the components I need and uh, working mainly with uh, CNCF components. But it depends if you are doing some in an enterprise context 
context and you want to have some of the nice functionality that OpenShift can give out of the box, it's a good solution. So it depends on your needs. <laughs> Okay, as often is the answer into to such questions. Uh, okay, um, all right. So I'm guessing no more questions right now. So again, thank you very much, Horacio. It was very interesting. It was nice having you here, and uh, all of our participants. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, in one hour, we will be having our second talk of today, and hope to see you all there. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.